Okay, so consciousness and perception. I'm going to attempt to make these subjects as interesting to you as they are to me, which is unfathomably so, so we'll see how we get on. Uh, you're having, I mean, some kind of conscious, perceptive experience right now, right? You're, you have some conscious awareness of the visual information that is falling on your retina. You might be aware of the, the, the sense of the, the clothes on your skin, of the seat that you're sitting on, of the sound of my voice and other sounds in the environment. Um, and you're aware of these in a conscious manner. These have some, there is something it is like to be experiencing these things. Now, I mean, for, for millennia, right, philosophers, spiritualists, uh, and contemplatives have, have tried to figure out the nature of the mind and of conscious experience. But, you know, alas, even with meditation and introspection and so on, it really took the microscope to reveal the neuron, right? It took chemistry to reveal serotonin and dopamine. There was no Buddhist in all of that time of history that went into the cave and realized, aha, I am made of a hundred billion neurons or anything like that. And it, it's, it's really no surprise, I think, that, that it really took the age of science and technology to really start to make some progress. And I don't mean to, to undermine um, spiritualist um, practices here because I, I practice some aspect, I practice a lot of meditation myself. So, but, but what I'm saying is, is as subjects of experience, I think it's inherently valuable to read the latest operating manual of the mind, right? So, so I aim to provide some of that in this series. And um, this is really a textbook based series, sticking to science. There is another series on the channel you'll see called Qualia Tourism, which is just more fun, so have a look if, that, if that's more your thing. Now in this introduction, I don't really want to just list off the contents of the course. You can look through the YouTube playlist titles for that. I do want to try and kind of introduce the terms and the structure of the series. Now, I'm not gonna to worry too much about introducing the term for consciousness about it, trying to define this that will come over the, the next few videos we'll see that defining consciousness be, can be very tricky but for our purposes now we could probably begin to get an idea of of perception in some sense now I, I like to think of perception as as something something some parts some parts of some nervous systems, I'll just put NS, some nervous systems seem to do, to do, right? So what does this all mean? I, the, one re I like to think about it like this because I think it was Sam Harris who I first heard say, there's not a great deal of difference between a ham sandwich and uh, the human brain in terms of the atoms used, right? There's, there's a bunch of atoms in the universe. There's a whole lot in the universe. But, you know, a lot of the life we see is really made of the same few atoms. Uh, in the ham sandwich in the brain, we have really carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Uh, just a few of the atoms off the periodic table. What seems to be important is the organization of those atoms such that um, when we get the in the universe when some of those atoms get together in the, the specific structure that they are in the brain then perception and consciousness seem to seem to arise um, uh, but we can go a step further than the ham sandwich by saying when we say that some parts of some nervous system seem to do it we, we're really saying that well if we look down here this is kind of an outline of the brain there's a part of the on the brain here this part which is the cerebellum, this means little brain. And the, the whole brain contains, I've seen it written as about 100 billion neurons, and the cerebellum uh, contains at least kind of half of all of those. I've seen, again, I've seen it written as up to 70% of all of the neurons in the brain are in the cerebellum. But we can damage the cerebellum significantly or even remove the cerebellum, and it doesn't seem to affect consciousness or perception. If we stimulate the cerebellum, it doesn't seem to affect consciousness or perception. The cerebellum seems to deal with motor functions, specifically the kind of fine coordination of motor functions. It would be very difficult to play the piano or go rock climbing if you lost the cerebellum, but your perception would be intact. So it seems that even within the nervous system, there are some parts of the brain that can do perception that are in the right configuration and some parts that aren't. And we want to figure out which bits are and how that, that, how that comes to be and so on. So we'll be studying those parts of the brain. A more useful definition, perhaps, which, which is, is going to serve us, is to, to, be, 
have a kind of process definition, something that has a beginning and an end, and we'll we'll, we'll briefly outline that uh, by calling it by calling it out there, out there, to in here. This process, but from out there to in here, what this means, out there to in here. So, what does this mean? We could we could say then that we have we have. Let's draw my coffee cup. So this is my coffee cup out there on my desk. And let's say that this is the real coffee cup, right? This is the coffee cup out there in the universe. We could talk about its atoms, uh, its location in space and time, uh, in terms of its x, y coordinates and so on. This is the coffee cup out there. Um, but this is not the coffee cup that's in my brain. This is not the coffee cup I'm perceiving. Instead, photons of light, light leaves the coffee cup, right? So already this far removed from the coffee cup. This is, we're already one step removed from the actual coffee cup. And then we have, say, our eye, or it could be some other sense organ. But we, in this case, we have our eye, and some of those photons will bounce off the lens of the eye. Others will make it through and collide with light-sensitive neurons, these light-sensitive cells at the back of the eye. This is stage one. This is the tip of the iceberg for perception. This is the very beginning of the process and already there is no more light at this point. Notice that, that everything after this occurs in complete darkness. There are no photons beyond this point. Um, this part is called transduction. This, this, this is really just a fancy word for, for convert, to convert. And this is our senses convert information from out there in the universe to a, a kind of electrochemical currency of the nervous system. Uh, in, this, in this sense, in the visual sense, we're, we're converting the energy in photons, absorbing the energy of a photon and converting it into um, a cascade of reactions in, in neurons, a chemical cascade of reactions. Um, that 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 signal then once those sense neurons and we have sense neurons to sense vibrations in the air that we convert into into sound or into touch or we can convert molecules into taste and so on um, then those once it's been converted it can be passed on to other neurons so there are a few other neurons in the eye before they get passed out to the optic nerve the optic nerve consists of these long neurons, and they can they uh, connect to other neurons in, say, the thalamus and up into the visual area of the brain. And that process of neurons passing the information to other neurons is the process of transmission. So we'll have to look at the process of transmission. So this is, again, the next step from out there to in here. We have converting energy, then transmission of that energy through the nervous system, through onto other neurons. And stage three, then, we could call processing and this is really where we have if, if I'm going to draw I'm just going to draw a brain not in the right space I'll just draw a brain over here the optic nerve will travel down and be passed into like the visual areas of the brain which is somewhere up here and in the brain we have then the coffee cup that is in here right this is the coffee cup in here it the, and notice that the coffee cup in here is not the coffee cup out there right they're in two different locations in space and even in time um this coffee cup in the brain exists a few milliseconds after the coffee cup out there because of the time it takes for the, that light to travel for those um for the signals to be passed through the neurons and ultimately for that conscious experience to be produced by the brain, by the kind of the virtual reality producing centers of the brain. And that all takes place because of processing between neurons. Neurons can, can um, process information in very complex ways and produce this experience. And you know what? I shouldn't even, I shouldn't even draw a coffee cup in the shape of a coffee cup in the brain because there is no, it's not like there are a bunch of neurons that move around and, and mold into the shape of a coffee cup and that's how I know I'm looking at a coffee cup. Instead, there's some activity here and here and here and in various... And somehow, from this activity across the whole of the brain, we produces this internal phenomenological experience of the visual scene of the coffee cup, our visual experience of the coffee cup. And we don't really know kind of what, through what angle the brain 
points its projector beam to create this experience. We know that even though this cup in our minds looks like it has depth and width and height, it really doesn't. It's, it's, it can somehow, it's this pattern of activity in the brain, yet we, our experience is not a pattern of activity. Our experience is a single coherent image of the coffee cup. And this applies to our other senses as well. We have this experience in here produced by the brain, and that's what we'll have to get to grips with. So some of the things we'll have to look at, this will take some terminology. We'll have to introduce some, some words that have come really out of philosophy and the, and the emerging science of the mind. Um, we'll, we'll, look at some, we'll look at some of those early on. And then we'll have to kind of get to uh, introduce some ideas at how we can measure perception. How do we study perception? This is a, an fMRI machine, but there are many, many other ways of, of measuring perception that have, that have emerged, and so we'll have to look at some of those. Um, we, we'll... We'll um, also look at the, the physiology. These are these. This is a kind of um, visualization of neurons uh, in the brain, where these neurons have been illuminated or fluoresced, uh, and we'll look at at the structure of neurons, of networks of neurons, and begin to understand how neurons can interact with each other. And we'll have to understand synapses and the, and the cellular biology of neurons to some degree. Um, and then we'll have to kind of move up to consciousness uh, and networks of neurons at the level of the brain, these vast networks. This is kind of the thalamocortical network in the brain that we think seems to have something to do with consciousness. When we're awake and when we're asleep, seems to be influenced by rhythms in these centers of the brain. And we'll have to look at states of consciousness like, like sleep. This is uh, an artist's depiction of sleep here. We'll have to look at these different states of consciousness, of conscious awareness and of attention. Um, and we'll get to grips with the kind of phenomenology of our conscious experience, this idea that there is something it is like to have conscious experience. Um, but before we do all of that, I'm just going to do one or maybe two videos on what, what are called case studies. Case studies are really, we're familiar perhaps with, with disorders of the spine. We know that if someone damages their spine, it can mean that they maybe can no longer use their legs or can no longer feel sensations in their, in their limbs. Um, but in the same way, there are parts of the brain that, that, that govern, that run and mediate perception. If we damage those parts of the brain, um, as some people have, it gives rise to some very, very strange um, cases of perception that, that have proven to be a fertile ground for speculation and curiosity in perception. So we'll look at some of the, the most fascinating case studies just for a video or two, just to spark that curiosity and to, to just, just to see what can happen when perception really goes wrong because it really does provide some, some fascinating uh, questions. So we'll look at that in the next video. Thanks for this. I'll see you in a bit.